Well, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Welcome into another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants with us here. Uh, my name's Jesse, and a big welcome to all of you. We've got groups joining again from Manitoba to Texas, BC to New Brunswick. It is truly across the continent today, 449 kids. So welcome as we get to showcase the coolest scientists and explorers on planet Earth. Now today, I am so thrilled to welcome back one of my favorite speakers we have ever had on. Truly, I know I say exciting things a lot. Uh, I'm truly, really excited for you to meet our, our speaker today in just a sec. But I do want to note on a housekeeping note, we are going to have a Kahoot today. So between our talk and our Q&A, four quick questions, test your understanding, have a little bit of fun. If you want to pull up that game pin in a separate tab, you can do that now. And I will announce that in between as well. So stay tuned for that Kahoot. Should be a lot of fun. Now, today we are diving back in with one of our favorite topics here at Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants, and that is polar bears. Now, we could not have a better guy than Dr. James Rapp. He is a polar bear expert, and today he's going to approach it through a little bit of a different means from bears to beach with some musical storytelling to highlight these incredible creatures and the place that they live. I think all of us know all about polar bears. It's probably the most talked about animal in our classes. Certainly when I was growing up, that was the case. I think it is for you too, but I promise you're going to learn some cool things today, have a little bit of a good time, and uh, thank you all so much for joining us. So without further ado, Dr. James, welcome in, man. Nice to see you again. <laughs> hello, 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 Jesse. Hi, everybody. It's really nice to be back. Love the music. <laughs> We, we really, I, I said to James before we got underway, I always tell our classes that are live that we're going to do a little bit of a dance party and several classes joined along and so did James and I figured he would given this topic today. So without well, further ado, if you want to dive in, man, and take us on more of a musical adventure, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I want to do. Now, last time I was here, uh, I talked about why polar bears have long noses and uh, this is in a sense, polar bears are definitely one of my passions uh, as an explorer, as a scientist as a writer, uh, and if you want to see that, of course, it's up on YouTube, like a lot of the uh, exploring by the seat of your pants questions, but um, there's been something that's happening I, in in uh, in my life that started, I mean, I started life as a marine biologist, that's me in about 1975, which I know is when the earth was cooling, but um, trying to take blood from the uh, femoral artery of a, uh, of a big male polar bear, and um, uh, that, work um, led to uh, work in science, but it also led to kind of a crisis in me that said, I, I really don't think I want to be uh, putting think animals in cages to understand them better. So I promised myself I would, if I was doing anything else with bears, I would do it in the wild. And that's what I've ended up doing. But interestingly, I've made some other shifts in my life, not so much away from science, but toward using that scientific knowledge towards being a writer and also to appreciating the people who know the bears best, who in Canada are the Inuit. And um, those bears, of course, uh, eat the same and harvest to say that's a little ringed seal that this big bear has, uh, has harvested up in Lancaster Sound. But um, there are so many parallels between people and bears um, and they absolutely fascinate me and have for along the way. But my entire life, and uh, I want to talk about this today because it's never too late to start being an explorer. And in fact, I would hope that uh, of all the things that you do in your life, you would be able to think about uh, if you want to be an explorer and you want to start asking questions, I really want to encourage you to say school isn't the only place you can ask those questions. You can ask them at home. You can ask them through your youth groups that you're involved in, but there's never too late to actually start on an arc of, of exploration. And my arc has taken me literally around the world um, and uh, into uh, writing about a lot of those adventures. And um, some of these may be in the library near you. Maybe if you're in Austin, Texas, maybe not so much, but um, my uh, my latest book is called Ice Walker, which <clears throat> is a portrait of humanity uh, in 36 months in the life of a female polar bear on Hudson Bay. And um, my purpose in writing about bears, as it will become clear, it really has to do with my worry that bears are creatures of the ice and the ice is disappearing. And that for me is a problem. So Ice Walker is really all about that. And so when I publish the book in English, when my publisher does, 
it gets out to more people and that's a good thing. And if it turns into presentations, that's a good thing as well. But I'm really excited. Uh, it was about a year ago now that Ice Walker was translated into French and published in France. And so it's now available to the Francophonie in North Africa and other French speaking countries around the world. And just this week, I've been talking with a publisher in Spain. And there's Ice Walker. I'm surprised they didn't put uh, the title in Spanish, but uh, the, the, the tale of Ice Walker, Nanu the bear and her two cubs has, uh, has been translated into Spanish and that's, uh, that's going on. And it's all of that communication that led to, and travel that led to Canadian Geographic identifying people who've made the biggest contribution to exploration in Canada. And I was very proud to be on that list for what they call crucial communication. But I wanna just start today by saying what is exploration? And for me, exploration is not something that grown-ups do or that old people do or that uh, crazy adventurers just do. Exploration is something I hope you're all doing in school, which is really asking questions and then going into the real world to find them. Now you can explore digitally, which is exactly what we're doing now, but my exploration and your exploration, if you choose to take that path, asking questions that take you into the real world, that is exploration, and then somehow returning to tell the stories of what you find. And I really do want to say that if I don't care what grade you're in, if you're in grade four or three or two or seven, six, uh, it's never too late to start asking those questions and because that will take you to people who have answers. It will take you to places that have answers. It'll take you to non-answers and other routes that might even be more exciting than the question you asked in the first place. But it's a way of thinking about the world that involves a lot of uncertainty. And I love risk. I love uncertainty. And maybe you will too. Um, so bears to beats today, I want to talk a little bit about Inuit life. Uh, the people of the north have been my friends since I first went north with, uh, with bears and uh, in the 1970s. And it's also about exploration. So I want to take you a little bit into the north. And then I really want to just tell you two um, sort of musical stories that arise out of my explorations, one involving a drum and one involving a kudlik which is a, an Inuit lamp. And, uh, and then I hope with, through your questions that we'll hear in your, uh, our, our chance to interact afterwards, after the quiz, we'll get a chance to do that. Um, my uh, writing of this book called Ice Walker actually started with um, a yen to meet the neighbors. So I'm Canadian. I spent a lot of time in the north of Canada, but I thought, well, gee, wouldn't it be fun to meet the neighbors? So um, several years ago, I went north to the Arctic Circle, which is 66.6 .6 degrees north, turned right and went around the world. And it's not that far. It's 17,662 kilometers, um, but it's it's a good hike, but it's not a, you know one that you can't do. I thought it would take a year. It actually took three years to do that. And what resulted from that was a book called Circling the Midnight Sun that takes readers around the world at the Arctic Circle. But I ran into bears all the way along the circle and also stories about bears, legends about bears, myths about bears. Bears are very much a part of every northern person's thinking, doesn't matter where you are in the circumpolar world. And... Um, it led to the last line of that book, which led me to the, all those experiences in the world led me to conclude that we are the bear, meaning um, we, if we start thinking about conservation the way I think we should, we should start imagining that the bear is our relative, that we are the bear. And it as just like the book uh, Ice Walker being translated into French and Spanish, and broadening the audience. And just like uh, exploring by the seat of your pants gives you an opportunity to hear some of the things that I've learned along the way. I was absolutely delighted when a potter, a woman who makes things out of clay called Jen Hotalling in Pugwash, Nova Scotia, read Circling the Midnight Sun, was very moved by the story, particularly the last line. And she actually made a whole installation out of clay 
that's 182 pieces of clay that were fired in a kiln. That is about um, a meter and a half, like uh, f uh, four and a bit feet high and probably nearly uh, uh, two thirds of a meter or three feet wide. But if up on the top, she, uh, because of the way she'd done this, is the line, we are the bear uh, on there. And that delighted me because that too took the story of conservation of bears to a wider audience and through a, another creative lens. And uh, so every time something's happened, and that's really what I want to talk about, every time, uh, like Ice Walker is actually a result of the previous book, you know how this project, it maybe is linked to the last project you did as your interests develop. Well, heaven forbid, um, I, Ice Walker is out there a few years ago, just out into the marketplace. And this guy in Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, and where, uh, you know, the seat of country music, sorry, those of you in Texas, Austin uh, city limits, or uh, I mean, there's a lot of country music around, but Nashville is probably most associated with. There's a guy down there as a songwriter called Jerry Vandiver. And Jerry, I'd met, turns out Jerry loves to can canoe, and he'd written some songs about canoeing. So when I was putting together some collections of music about uh, about canoes, Jerry was part of that. But Jerry called me up one day and he said, I've just read Ice Walker. He said, it's the most amazing story about this bear. And he said, I want to write a song with you about that. And so during the pandemic, we Zoomed together, as you do. Uh, I'm sure all of you at some point were on distance learning. Well, we're on distance <laughs> learning right now. Uh, Jerry and I Zoomed and went back and forth and diddled around a bunch of ideas that grew out of the book. And the next thing you know, we start a song starts to come together. But the more I thought about two guys, one in Nashville and one in Ontario, writing this song about polar bears in the north, I thought, you know, we need to get a northern musician into this mix. And that's where I thought, I'm going to call my friend Hickwalk. And he is one of the most interesting people with whom I've traveled over the years. Um, his, his English name is David Sirkowak, but his Inuit name is Hickwalk. And uh, he, uh, through programs that we've been involved in, uses a drum, which is an Inuit storytelling tool that goes back to his early days. Uh, he grew up at a place called Enidai Lake, west of Hudson Bay and um, where his family lived uh, largely on caribou. But um, any time, like other Inuit, they would make their skin houses in the summer and their snow houses in the winter. And when they all came together to tell stories, it was the drum that was used to tell those stories. Uh, the songs would be boom, boom, boom. The song would bring them together. And I thought, boy, you know, here are Jerry and and uh, and me writing a story about a bear that was in a book. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to get Hickwalk involved? Now, Hickwalk is no uh, slouch of a guy. He actually, for those of you, maybe your teachers know of a writer called Farley Mowat, who wrote People of the Deer, which is all about David's people and the desperate people. Hickwalk was a baby in those in those books, for those of you who are interested, and actually has taken an incredible role um, in um, his people were moved by the government of Canada away from where they lived, partly because Farley Mowat said they were in desperate straits, but Hickwalk has, has lived an incredible life, and if you want to know about his life, uh, you just have to get onto YouTube and find, put his name, David Sirkowat, an apology seven, 70 years later, fantastic story. But I called Hickwalk and I said, hey, buddy, um, do you, do you want to, he's a big fan of country music, and do you want to help sing a song and write a song? And he said, sure. So um, there's Jerry in a studio in, uh, in Nashville. Here's me in a studio not far from here. And uh, here's Hickwalk in his kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from bears to beets. Uh, so the story of a polar bear in a book uh, gets just turned into a song and three people come together. And uh, here's a little taste of what it sounds like um, in, uh, in a recorded form. 
Between two worlds of water and ice On the edge of life and survival White fur shimmers in the Arctic night On her path ever mindful she is us we are her walk as one on this earth in her steps we learn to see again we learn to care she is us we are prepared That's a little weird, eh? Oh, my goodness. Um, if you're sitting there thinking like I did when I started playing the guitar in grade five, that music is somehow separate from everything else in your life, it's fun to do, to play the piano, to do whatever. You know, your parents give you p piano lessons or music lessons. I always thought that was separate from everything. But as I've grown older, I realized that music is so important to me, but it's also a very important storytelling tool. And if you're thinking that you maybe want to be a television producer or a writer or a filmmaker or a storyteller in conventional means, for those of you who are musician, musicians, you might want to start thinking now about musical explorations because music is something that seems to connect people uh, in ways that words don't. But uh, boy, I'm so excited that that we are the bear idea is now, now in musical form. The second story I want to tell you, as promised, is about a kudlik, a lamp, and uh, it's got another musical story to it as well. Um, I uh, uh, used to guide hikes and canoe trips and that sort of thing, but uh, lately what I do is I work for a ship that sails in the Arctic and the Antarctic, for, and sometimes in the Austral summer, which is now in Antarctica. I'm not there now. but uh, And this is really taking people to the ends of the earth, and uh, using music where it happens. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a journey on that ship called the Ocean Endeavour from Kangerlussuaq, Greenland, to Koloktok, copper mine, um, at the mouth of the copper mine river in the northwestern Arctic in, in Nunavut. And uh, an amazing thing happened. And I want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, we, um, if you want to know where Kaluktuk is relative to where we are, I, I've used Toronto as a reference point. That's for those of us who don't live in Toronto, we der derisively say that's the center of the universe. But Kaluktuk is about 3,400 kilometers from Toronto in a northwesterly distance. And if you want to just get an idea, it's about the same distance. It's just a little bit farther than Vancouver. Interestingly, if you want to go from to Vancouver from Toronto, you just get on a plane in Toronto and you're there about four or five hours later. If you want to go to Kaluktuk, as I will in about uh, two weeks, uh, it's actually a two-day journey. You have to do a journey up to Yellowknife on Great Slave Lake, which is right there, and then another flight up to Kaluktuk. But um, Kaluktuk has been on the map for a number of things. It's a small Inuit community, but you may have seen the film The Grizzlies, about a group uh, of lacrosse players from that town. And uh, if you haven't seen that film, it's uh, quite an impactful film. It's about kids who are struggling with um, uh, growing up uh, in a small community and having some difficulties with that and how sport brings them back around. But that's what Luktuk is known for. Anyway, uh, we're on this ship sailing along uh, that body of water and we stopped at a place called Kogluk Tuaraluk, which is, you know, might know it's a little bit similar to Kogluktok. Kogluktok means big falls, 
And Korluk Tuoluk means little falls, but there's a river coming down to this place, which in English is called the Tree River. But we stopped there with the ship to, um, to have a landing there and go and see. The rocks there are particularly interesting. And I'll tell you that one of the things that this company does, which I really, really uh, I think is important, is it has people aboard the ship, Inuit northerners from the communities. This is Susie Iveta Goyalik, uh, who is an Inuit cultural educator. And one of the things she did on the ship and does on the ship is she lights a lamp called a kudlik um, that symbolizes, it's like the hearth, her people um, moved beyond the tree line, and in doing so, they moved away from wood for fuel, for heat, and for cooking. But ingeniously, the Inuit were able to get the oils from sea mammals like seals and whales, and to use that oil for heat and for cooking. And the device that they do that in is this sort of hollowed out rock called a kudlik, a, a lamp, a seal oil lamp, and it has a wick that's made with fiber from a, a, a plant called Arctic cotton grass. But uh, I mean, you could use fiber from a from an old T-shirt if you wanted as a wick. But she lights that lamp as a kind of symbol of the hearth at the heart of the Inuit people. And uh, but on this day at uh, at this location. Susie was one of the cultural educators. There were some archaeological sites there. And uh, I want to just tell you that uh, seals that polar bears eat, that's a little ring seal. There's my friend uh, Devin Manick in Resolute. He's just caught a seal. And you can see that there's a lot of fat in under the seal. That's what they actually cook and cook out the oil. They use heat to get the oil from the from the thing. I thought you might be interested that uh, Devon lives just a bit north from here in a place called uh, Resolute Bay. That's Devon uh, two days ago. He's out seal hunting with his, uh, I think, with his uncle. That's the moon uh, there. Uh, here he is on a happier day last May with his dogs. I was out with him with his dogs. Um, but if you want to get an idea of what uh, Devon's life is like, he's on Facebook as Devon Manick. And you can see that. And he's on um, um, uh, Instagram as ThunderXYZ. Incredible um, communicator and incredible kid. I've been I've known him since he was 15. And he's if you wanted to follow him, you can just make a note of, of those. But uh, I wanted to say that you may know that it's dark in the Arctic in the in the winter. Today, I think, is the last day for Devon. Uh, He'll see the sun for the first time tomorrow, having not seen the sun since mid-December. But anyway, here we are. Oh, yeah, this is what it looked like yesterday. He was out um, uh, hunting, and uh, that is the twilight. Uh, you can see that the sun is getting very close to poking up of where he is. But the lamp uh, that Susie lit uh, was a lamp that would be in every uh, igloo, every house. And although the Inuit all live now in uh, in regular houses like the rest of us, the lamp still is a very important part of their symbolic remembering of who they are. And uh, there she is inside a community uh, igloo uh, eating some frozen char, but there was a lamp in there as well. So we're on this uh, at this site at uh, the mouth of the Tree River. And people came ashore to, to look at, um, at the rocks and so on. And Susie was standing on the shore and uh, she overheard one of the passengers of the ship say, whoa, this is kind of a uh, barren, forbidding place. I don't know how anybody could live here. And Susie heard that and just thought, huh, you know, this is where my family, where I grew up. And, uh, you know, this is home for me. I wish I could show this woman <coughs> how connected I am to this place. Well, we had our landing. Everybody was going back to the ship. Uh, I was actually on polar bear guard duty that day. So I came down from the high ground, um, having looked for polar bears to make sure there was no interaction with people and bears. And there's Susie at the shore, just standing there looking at the, at the rocks on the beach. And she wasn't saying anything. And I looked at her, I looked down, and lo and behold, what was there was a broken lamp, an old, old soapstone lamp 
that had been carried by some of her forebears. You can see the piece on the left is actually full of lichen and, and earth kind of growing into the beach. And Susie, this find for her was so poignant. It was so touching, particularly because somebody would come ashore and uh, she said, I need to tell the people that I found this. She left it where it was. I was so moved by what I'd seen in Susie finding this lamp that I came back aboard the ship and started thinking, oh, there must be a song here somewhere. <coughs> and I went to the another musician who was aboard the boat called Barney Bentall, who has a band called Caribou Horses. He used to have one called the uh, Caribou Express. He had one called the Legendary Hearts. But I said, Barney, this is, and I told him the story of Susie finding this lamp. And uh, he said, sure, I'll write a song with you. And uh, that's exactly what happened. Susie stood up and told what had happened. And we were able to play uh, a song. And then Susie, in the manner of, of David Sirkwak, Hickwak, and her husband, Joe Allen, they actually drummed while we uh, while we sang this song for the first time. And it was just, it was kind of a really, really neat uh coming together of people. The moon are to hold the oil, cotton grass from frozen soil. Weathered hands perfect the flame, baby cry, she gets a name. Wind and the waves harpoon in the air. So on a handsome coat. That's a little taste of that. A new moon lamp, um, a new moon arc to hold the oil. That's a sort of the shape. It's like a D shape um, uh, thing. And um, so shortly after that happened, Susie came to me and she gave me a big hug and she said, would you guys come to Kolok Talk and record that song with us in the winter? And uh, that's what's happening in two weeks. And I'm very, very excited about that because there's some other musical stuff that's happening that really marks another important change in the North. So we're going uh, to the home of the Grizzlies, uh, Kolok Talk High School. There it is in summer. That's a picture I took a few summers ago. Um, that's the gym at the high school with those beautiful big char, the fish in relief on the outside. And uh, we're going there to do songwriting workshops with the youth in town and also to record uh, what became called Susie's Song or Land of a Thousand Drums. But uh, I thought you would be interested to know that uh, northern schools don't have all of the uh, resources quite often of southern schools. And there's an organization called Arts Can Circle that is a Canadian organization started by a guy called Mike Stevens, who is a harmonica player. He started this organization about 20 years ago, and its mission is to gather up instruments, sometimes used ones, recondition them, sometimes new that are donated, and to package them up with musicians and send them into northern communities. And I'm delighted that when we go up there to record Susie's song in two weeks, that Arts Can Circle, I, they've actually sent five homemade Inuit drums, two keyboards, uh, six electric guitars, a bass guitar, a couple of amplifiers, and uh, we're going to make uh, some joyful music with the kids. But the exciting thing about this project, which became called the Unip Kaktuat Project, Unit Kaptuet means uh, telling stories from the land. And what we're going to do is, what I hope you will do at some point, is actually take some of the stories from the kids in town who are living full lives up there, sometimes difficult lives, but for them to learn a bit about the musical instruments, but also to work with musicians that we'll have up there will be a team of five plus Susie and Joe. Um, so they might learn to drum with Susie and Joe. They might learn to do a bit of guitar, but we're really interested in them telling their stories because one of the important shifts that's happening as Canada grows up is that instead of people like me speaking 
about the Inuit and the stories, which I've done most of my life, my shift is helping uh, Northerners start to tell their own stories. Instead of being an amplifier, I now become sort of a record player on the part of the people who were there. So there's Billy McWilliam. He's a bit older now uh, with his laughing at these guys who are playing games. But uh, Billy his, uh, would be one of the people, I hope, who will be uh, supporting this project and learning. And uh, so um, that is my From Bears to Beats uh, tale. And uh, it has exploration in it. It has the changing north in it. It has northern conditions in it. It has the notion of... Um, exploration. And uh, I know that in each of your classrooms with your wonderful teachers, you'll be talking about related subjects. Sometimes we think of bears as a kind of a scientific thing. Bears for me are a cultural thing. And uh, bringing music and bears together is kind of where I am in my journey as an explorer now. And Jesse, I'm going to hand it back to you because it your turn to dance with the bear. Well, thank you so, so much, James. And for that context of what Northern communities are like, your own adventures up there, it's such a special thing because we don't have the chance to feature someone who's had such a diverse experience up in the North and with those communities as you. And I, I really appreciate the chance to hear all this today. And I also like the chance to talk about something other than science. I love science. I'm a scientist by background. We feature a lot of scientists. Dr. James is a scientist. But if you are keen on arts or business or economics or history or anything, there's a role for you in these amazing places. And I think that's a really important message that we like to feature in these broadcasts is that really whatever you're keen on, if you want to end up in an explorer context, whether it's on a ship or in space or in the Arctic or what have you, um, there's some really, really cool roles for you. So that was that was a lot of fun. Thank you, James. Um, we're going to dive in with a polar bear focused Kahoot. And then we're going to take questions from all our classes. Uh, we've got a few others join us after we got underway. So stay tuned for a big Q&A, everybody. I'm going to pull up our Kahoot while we're doing this. And uh, again, this is a little more focused on some of our polar bear main stats. And if you are keen on some polar bear biology as well, as James mentioned on our YouTube channel, we do have the program, Why Do Polar Bears Have Long Noses? Uh, this is also on YouTube. So if you want to share this with family and friends as well. And James, I want you to uh, let us know how the musical session goes in a few weeks. It's so exciting that you're getting the chance to head up there. Very, very cool. Uh, I'll give a few more seconds here to pour in. Uh, if you're new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. And I want to note, too, um, you mentioned Yellowknife is sort of a base to head up further north. Yellowknife is one of my favorite places I've ever had the chance to visit in Canada. If everyone gets the chance to go to Yellowknife, you should. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary city. Let's dive in with some polar stuff. Some of this might be because we didn't cover it. We might get a lot of interesting answers here, which I'm excited about. And then we're going to enter our amazing five sixes right after this for our first question. All right. We talked at the beginning about polar bears. Largest land carnivore. How big can they get? 500 pounds, 800 pounds, 1,000 pounds, or over 1,400 pounds. Let's see. YouTubers, please feel free to chime in as well. And you can share questions in the chat. We've got six seconds left. James, what's the biggest polar bear you saw in person? Uh, it's at Kaktivik Island. They called him Big Albert. And I think he, well, I'm not going to tell you because are we finished answering? We are. We're finished answering. Over 1,400 pounds is our correct answer. But how big was Big Albert? <laughs> Fat Albert, I think they were estimating at 3,000 pounds. It's ridiculous. If you, if you Google uh, uh, like polar bear Fat Al Albert Kaktivik, uh, you'll see him. Huh. The monstrous animal. Well, Shining Sloth takes our lead as we go into our second question. All right. Polar bear noses are how much more effective than ours? Are they twice as effective? Are they 2,000 times as effective? 100 times or 800 times? These are wildly varying answers, James. We're giving them lots of room to think here. Well, <laughs> anybody who watched Why Polar Bears Have Long Noses will know that answer. They will. I had some fun uh, searching some questions for this. I think we're going to get a lot of wrong ones in this one. Yeah, it is 2,000 times. It's ridiculous. <laughs> they are uh, an incredible, incredible creature. You have them listed as it's many times more than a bloodhound. A bloodhound is 300 times as good as us, and they're eight times better than that. They have to smell seals from, like, miles away through the ice, yeah. which is incredible. They're a special creature. 
Um, by the way, I want to stress too, you, it's so interesting. Uh, you talked about the fact that, uh, again, approaching bears from this, this musical or a cultural avenue rather than a uh, physiological or biological one. We're increasingly seeing this in Canadian programs in, in particular. Bison, caribou, polar bears. Uh, so much of Canadian culture and history is linked to the land and linked to specific animals on that land. Uh, cod here in Newfoundland where I live. Uh, and so it's a special chance to talk about that too. And I, I'll share some links to our classes afterwards on more on that front. All right. Polar bears are icons of conservation. How many are there? 100, 25,000, 5,000, or a million? This is rough. It's not exactly. We don't know exactly to the one polar bear, but in the range. What do we think? One more second. Get those answers in. It is... 25,000, so the, that was the, our majority one. 20 to 30,000 is where we estimate polar bears are, unless there's been any update on that number, but that's what I have as the latest. There are, uh, 19 subpopulations around the circumpolar world, yep. Which again, it's so funny, I think people's context is people, where there's over 8 billion, that's really weird. Most animals are not at 8 billion. In fact, we're the only animal other than like some fish and krill and bugs that are at 8 billion. That's very unusual for a big mammal. And then finally, of course, a topic that we hear about a lot in our classes, polar bears are under threat from climate change. I think we should get all the answers on this one pretty readily. Um, the case of the matter is everything's a bit under threat from climate change. The world's changing really rapidly and uh, species are having to adapt at a rate that is not standard for them. And we're having a lot of changes that, I mean, certainly we're seeing as people. My Ask your parents, ask your teachers about what the weather was like when they were kids. And I guarantee it's different than it is now. That's always my go-to analogy for anyone who wants to know about climate change in a very real sense. But our winner as Shining Sloth, if you are any of these folks, let us know who you are. Wow, Miss Coddington's class just lost their minds when I said that. Way to go, guys. <laughs> um, so we're going to go to our, our Q&A now. We've got about eight, ten minutes left. Uh, hopefully you guys can all stick around. Amazing grade five, six is I'm going to head to you. I'd love to hear your question. Anything you want to know about polar bears, James's adventures, the music, the Inuit communities up there that he's had the chance to work with. Uh, let's take it away. Hey, five, sixes. Oh, my God. We are the bear. That came up a lot, right? Is this oh, us? Yes, you. Come on you. up. Come on up. <laughs> Come on up. He's got to get here from his chair. Sorry. Thank so you, Tom. You are the bear. <laughs> I love you talking about that. Hi. All right, Virgin. Um, you want to ask the how is Demet as a uh, demonstrator? Yeah. How is how has uh, he not seen the sun for like like a month or even a, yeah it, it, since uh, the middle of December? I love it. Excellent question. And the reason for that is 23 and a half degree tilt. The Earth, if the Earth and, and the Sun rotated on axes that were parallel, uh, it would be 10, 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness around the world all the time. But as it happens, uh, what have I got here? Well, I'll just show you. The Earth is not up and down like the Sun's axis. It's actually tilted toward the sun in the summer. And that's why, so it, the, the earth's going around here. Uh, I should have had a little demonstration. In the summer, you see the sun 24 hours a day in the Arctic, but in the winter, this, the, earth, <laughs> the earth is uh, face, <laughs> facing away from the sun. And uh, what happens then is uh, we get a changing day length. Now, I don't care where you are in Texas or in Manitoba, you will have longer and shorter days. And you know that the longest day in the Northern Hemisphere is in June, and that's called the solstice. And that's the day at which the sun appears for 24 hours in the Arctic. But then there's the shortest day of the year, which is December 21st, and that's also a solstice. And that's the day when for people at the Arctic Circle, Devon's quite a bit above the Arctic Circle. That's the day when, when their sun disappears. So uh, for Devon, um, he's been in total darkness. But lest you think it's like when you have the curtains drawn in your bedroom or you're hiding in the bottom of your closet where it's like cave dark. Darkness in the Arctic is one of the most beautiful, surreal, enchanting conditions you could ever want because you're what you're doing is you're on the ice which is a reflective surface but it's reflecting starlight moonlight 
And it is, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And then in Devin's case, as you saw, as you're coming out of the winter darkness, it's like a perennial um, uh, sunrise sunset situation. The, the sky is orange and beautiful. Uh, great, great question. It is. It's one of my very favorite things in all of science. And I really encourage you to look up the Arctic night because there was a BBC series recently, Seven Worlds, One Planet. They had North America. It was in the Arctic and it was at night. And it's one of the most surreal, otherworldly places on planet Earth. Like it doesn't even look like Earth. It's just astonishing how beautiful it gets up there. So great question, guys. We're going to head to Miss Coddington's class next. Miss Holvin, you're next. So unmute your mic. Uh, come on in, Mrs. Coddington. Hey. How does music help you tell your stories? Uh, that is another $10 question. I think what happens, I think that we listen to music with a different part of our brain. And uh, there's a, the, the front part of our brain that does all the thinking um, uh, is, is important. But I think music lands partly, for lack of a better or more physiological term, music lands in your heart. And when you think of movies that are sad, Oftentimes, the story is sad, the imagery is sad, the pictures are sad, but what really takes it into your heart and makes you want to just bawl your eyes out is the music. And music uh, uh, takes a story, I think, and adds emotional dimensions to it that um, can be used very effectively to make the story more memorable. It's a beautiful way of answering that, James. I really encourage our classes, look up the same scene in a movie, but with different music, and you can see how radically it alters it. Like, it really does impact us in the heart, and I think that's, a, that's really nice. Um, Miss Holman's class, we're going to have you guys, if you want to unmute your mic, I'll come to you in just a second. Uh, Miss Taylor's class, if you guys want to unmute your mic, I can come to you first because I can see you guys on camera. So there you are. Hey. <laughs> yeah, I just want to grab Yep, you're oh. good, man. Evan. What do you know if the polar bears are male or female? Ooh. Um, that's a really, well, they were all good questions. Um, how do you know uh, by size? You can't just look at them and tell. I mean, male bears don't wear cologne and female bears don't wear miniskirts. So let's leave out the behavior. But how they behave can uh, females will often have cubs with them. Males are often bigger. Males are usually alone. Um, males have a whole lot more scars, having fought for the ability to, uh, to have young bears with females. Um, but the actual, um, the actual sort of genetic or the, the, the physio, what am I talking about? The difference between sex organs um, that you know you could see in humans when we take our clothes off. Uh, bears don't ever take their clothes off, so you never get to see that. And if you're in close, you might see a polar bear's penis, uh, but I, I doubt it. Um, so you've got to rely on behavior and size and uh, affiliations like uh, cubs with mums. Um, and then, of course, when you're doing what I did as a scientist early on, when you're actually uh, tranquilizing the bears and catching them, you actually are able to determine by other means, by by anatomy, that uh, that they're that they're. Uh, and of course, if you do DNA analysis, female polar bears have, have double X. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. No, that's first. That's the answer. Yeah. Um, great question, guys. All right, we're going to head to Avoca West, grade three, Glenview, Illinois. We're heading to you and then Colburn Public School. We'll wrap up with you guys in a second. Hey, guys. So I wanted to tell you, we have two students whose questions kind of build on each other. So okay. here you go. And you got the name right this time, Jesse. I did. <laughs> um, uh, have well, you ever the pet the polar bears? Uh, wait. Excuse. Have you pet them? And what's the second one? Okay. Um, the second one is... What happens when a bear comes to your tent when you're camping? Yeah. What do you think? Perfect. Uh, first question first. Um, their hair, yes, I petted a polar bear. Uh, was it awake at the time? No, uh, happily. Um, uh, its hair is coarse, uh, not smooth like a cat. It's more like a... Uh, a cow. I mean, it feels rougher on your hand. It's thick, though. It's really thick. Polar bear hair is hollow. 
uh, their skin is black. And if you dig down on their skin, you'll see you'll see they're black or dig down on their fur. But it's it's very thick and it's it, well, look, they can function in, in cold, cold weather. The second question, have you ever had a tent? Uh, yes, and uh, it's always cause for uh, a, an immediately reflection on food chains. Um, yeah, and uh, it's an experiential lesson. You realize that you're not the top predator anymore. Nope. Um, and I will say that uh, the first time that happened, one walked right in a tent. I was with an Inuk. I was with a, an Inuit guy who was whose job it was to protect us. And sadly, that bear became a rug almost instantaneously. Uh, because it was intent on eating us for breakfast. Yep. Other times, it's just a matter of being really aware. Um, the last thing you want to do is destroy a bear for any reason, um, but um, uh, unless it's being hunted for food. Um, but um, you can be very strategic about it and just make sure that your tent is not in a place that is of also of interest to bears. What a neat question. And I mean, it, it's true. Like polar bears are one of the few animals on this planet that will actively go for a person to eat them. There's very few creatures that fit that bill. Sharks are one that a lot of people sort of instinctually think of. And sharks will not do that. Sharks will swim away over the horizon as fast as possible if they see a person. Whereas if you're out on the Arctic tundra and you run across a polar bear, that's a very bad situation to be in. So I'm glad we get this query. And I'm glad you mentioned that there are people that are usually with scientists and explorers to help protect them in these situations. Uh, you talked about being a polar bear guard in one of the uh, programs that you shared earlier, so or the pictures you shared earlier. So I appreciate that question, guys. James, time flies and you're having fun. I wish we could talk all day, but I know some of our class have to go to a next period in a minute. So I'm going to head to Colburn Public School. Thanks for coming in, guys. I'm going to take a question from you guys, and then uh, we'll wrap up from there. But I promise there's more to come. I'll share lots of resources and polar bear conservation, cool surveys, and more when we're done. So stay tuned for that in a minute. But Colburn, if you want to wrap us up. Hey, guys. Are we there? Maybe? Oh, it's with audio only. Audio Hello. only, yeah. Hi. Oh, you had your audio on. Oh, they flicked it off. That's okay. If you guys don't, oh, wait, they're all back on. Hi, guys. Uh, Hello. We were wondering who wants to ask questions that we wrote. A, uh, Blake, it was your question. Where do polar bears sleep? Yes. Where do they sleep? <laughs> when you're when you're the king of the of the uh, the Arctic jungle, you sleep wherever you like if you're a male and just they literally sleep on the ice and they need sleep for sure they often sleep after they've had a big meal uh, when the females uh, the females when they're having their young and raising their young they actually make dens in the snow so they sleep there too and in fact all it during the time when they're in the den uh, the mothers are, are almost in a semi-sleep uh, condition there You'll be interested to know as a final point, the work that I did at the University of Guelph with polar bears was in part funded by NASA, the space people. They were very interested in suspended animation. They wanted to know when they send astronauts to Mars, how do, how do animals get into that state of semi, semi dormancy? And one of the animals that they were putting money into, research they were putting money into was polar, <laughs> polar bear uh, uh, dormancy and uh that's just a kind of a, a a quirky fact so in the event that we ever get to mars we have uh, in part polar bears to thank for the understanding of physiology when we put our astronauts to sleep so they can use fewer resources on the way to another planet how cool is that james never a dull moment uh <laughs> thank you so much for this spectacular program again unique approach we're going to share all sorts of great resources with the classes and as we wrap up every broadcast i'm going to bring in all our classes on camera to say a big thank you and farewell so amazing five six is miss cardigan's class of <laughs> <Everybody. laughs>